Welcome back. Today's topic, differential signaling with RS-422, also known as TIA-422, EIA-422 or NC-422, the basics. That will involve, well, currently just a function generator as a signal source, but later on two Arduino MCUs talking to each other via two Renaissance ISL8490 RS422 transceivers and of course, uh, well, you can't see it really here, an RS422 transmission line. Let's kick the whole thing off with having a look at what's currently going on here on my bench. So we have our signal generator here, which is feeding the signal via 50 ohm coax cable to our breadboard where it is terminated with a 50 ohm resistor because it's 50 ohm output, 50 ohm cable, so 50 ohm termination. Then we have here half of a uh, Renesas ISL8490 RS422 transceiver, obviously the transmitter half here. Uh, yeah, little decoupling capacitor 100 nano for the voltage supply which comes from the Arduino, okay. And that thing takes the input signal and turns it into the input signal itself and the inverse of the input signal. So if here a pulse comes in, you have on that line the same pulse, different voltage levels maybe, but the same pulse form. And on the other line, you have the inverted pulse form. And yeah, these three lines, these were the long jumpers that went over to the other breadboard where we use another half of the ISL8490. This time, of course, the receiver half. And we terminate our transmission line here with 100 ohms. We will talk about termination later, but 100 ohms is a yeah, arbitrary value. Uh, value. It just took 100 ohms. Decoupling capacitor here again for the VCC2 for that thing, which again comes from another Arduino. And uh, these VCCs are galvanically isolated from each other, but please note we have an explicit ground connection here. And of course, at the end, we get our input signal out again. Now, why is that called differential signaling? That's because the receiver only cares about the voltage difference between our voltage A and our voltage here on line B. And please note, both voltages are still referenced to our ground line. So as long as voltage A is greater than voltage B, we get here a high out. And if voltage B is greater than voltage A, then we get a low out. There's also some hysteresis uh, built in, a few hundred millivolts. So if these two voltages are crossing, we don't get a fiddle or noise out here. And just to get it out of the way, the terminology used here, yeah, YZ for the sending pins, AB for the receiving pins, lines A, B and C, uh, it's not very uniform across the interweb or data sheets you look into or any explanations you find for RS or specifications you find for RS422. That thing here, the transmitter, is also often called the driver, D. Well, that's okay, I guess. But Y and Z are also often labeled TX plus minus or TDX plus minus or AB, yeah, like uh, the receiver pins, or T TXA and TXB. Likewise, uh, the input pins here, A and B, are labeled sometimes RX plus minus, RDX plus minus, and if you use for these pins, the A and B, then it's here A prime and B prime, and of course RXA and RXB. 
Our sea line is also often called just the ground or signal return. Didn't write it down here, sorry. And the B line is also sometimes called a knot. Yeah. And that's how the whole thing looks at the scope. So that's my input signal here to the transmitter from my signal generator. It's roughly between, yeah, a little over zero volts and is almost five volts, yeah, four volts. So perfect logic level. Then this is the signal on our A line. And as you see, it's not quite down to zero volts and uh, it goes up to two volts. And of course, if uh, my input signal is high, this is on its top voltage level. And if my input signal is low, it's on its lowest level. And that's my B line, my inverted signal line. And uh, of course, it's exactly the inverse. And that's the output of the receiver. And yeah, perfect CMOS voltage levels. Yeah, it goes from zero to five volts. So yeah, perfect. I think it's time to have a closer look at the RS422 specification. And I'm sorry there will be several pages like this, but I really think you need to know what you are dealing here with. Anyway, let's start with the differential output voltage and the output voltages of each transmission line with no load. So what maximum voltages is a driver allowed to put on the signal lines? So for the differential voltage, that would be a maximum of plus minus 10 volts. And for each of the signal lines, VOA and VOB, it would be a maximum of plus minus six volts. So please note, all what we've seen on the oscilloscope can in theory happen on a voltage below ground within negative voltage range. Moving on to the differential voltage and the common mode voltage under load. So the differential voltage, yeah, we had here a maximum of plus minus 10 volt, but with a load of, yeah, two times 50, so 100 ohms, that's what I have on the breadboard, by the way, the minimum differential voltage is defined as plus minus two volts. And then, yeah, measured here in the middle, so the average of these two voltages, our common mode voltage, is not to exceed under load plus minus three volts. Now I already told you that this common mode voltage is defined and here realized as a one-to-one -one resistor voltage divider as simply the voltage on our A line plus the voltage on our B line divided by two, so the average. Uh, in a more graphic form, this would look something like that. So we have here our zero volt line and here blue, we have our VOA and red our VOB. And that common mode voltage would be the virtual zero line averaging here between our VOB and VOA. And again, I mentioned it uh, here with VOA and VOB can be minus six volts. All this here can be happening in a, a negative voltage range below our zero volt ground. Let's see if our Renaissance chip is actually specced according to the specification. So we have here the driver differential V out at no load and it's a maximum of VCC. VCC should be between 4.5 and 5.5 loads, but absolute maximum rating is 7 volts. So we can say, yeah, that's okay. So the driver differential V out with load is at a minimum, uh, even for 50 ohm load, of two volts. So that's also okay. 
And for our driver common mode voltage, they say that's at a maximum of three volts. Now our uh, fourth parameter here from the specification, the voltages of the A and B line, maximum plus minus are not given here because they are within VCC. So they are all within maximum of seven volts. So also okay. The last three parameters for our transmitter driver. First, the <laughs> short circuit output current. So whenever you connect one of the data lines to ground, current should not exceed 150 milliamps. And then a little bit more complex, the delta common mode voltage and the delta differential voltage. I've redrawn our little diagram we already seen here again a little bit on a bigger scale. So this is all about asymmetries in your outputs in the inverted and non-inverted output. So as an example uh, let's say our non-inverted output behaves yeah, perfectly between 1 and 5 volts again. But our inverted output for some reasons can only go up to a little bit lower, let's say four volts. So first of all, our differential voltage between yeah, signaling a one or a high state and signaling a low or zero is different. And that's the delta output differential voltage. And at the same time, if you have such asymmetries, of course, your common mode voltage, so the average between your two output voltages, we talked about that before on the other parameter too, it also changes a little bit. And that would be the delta common mode voltage. And both should not exceed 0.4 volts. Looking at the data sheet again of our little Renaissance chip, the change in magnitude, the delta VOD, uh, differential V out for complementary states is a max of 0.2 volts. So yeah, we are in the green again. And the change in magnitude of driver common mode V out for a complementary stage delta VOC is also a maximum of 0.2 volts. We are also in the green there. And the driver short output current high or low is maximum Mom, 250 milliamps. Ooh, but it says here note nine, and note nine says <laughs> typical performance curves on page 10. There we find this little diagram here. So a driver output current versus short circuit voltage. And that's a little bit hard to read. It gives a lot of information. So we have the output current here, which can be positive or negative. And that's because the output voltage is, yeah, always reference to ground. And they assume, according to the specification, that our ground for some reasons or another uh, can be more negative, okay? But we are only interested in this line here that assumes that actually the ground voltage is zero volt relative to our two outputs. So if Y or Z are high, we sink here at zero volts about 120 milliamps into ground. And if Y or Z are low, we obviously, uh, yeah, low output, uh, we, we sink nothing. We cannot sink anything into ground, zero milliamps. Okay, I simplified things here because this uh, line is of course wandering a little bit to the left and to the right because our output voltage in the low state is not quite zero. It's a little bit higher. I think it was a volt 
so even our low pins will sink 20 milliamps or so into the ground if we short circuit them. So that's really here a maximum, uh, what did we read in the diagram of 120 milliamps and we can give that a pass too. Last page of specifications and then we're done uh, at least for now. And this time it's all about the receiver. And we are interested here in the differential voltage it can withstand at the inputs and the voltages measured to ground on both lines it can withstand. And of course there's also something in the specification about the input impedance. This is just yeah symbolic here that resistor. The specification has a lot of you know current measurements into the input pins at different voltages and such but uh, yeah it all boils down to some kind of input resistance which is not exactly represented here by just the resistor between the non-inverted and inverted input pins. Anyway Differential voltage and the input, it has to work to up to plus minus 10 volts and it should survive absolute maximum plus minus 12 volts. It doesn't have still to work probably as at plus minus 12 volts, but it has to survive it. Now input voltages at the A line and the B line, it has to work up to plus minus 10 volts. And the input impedance it must be at the minimum 4 kilo ohms. Now let's talk about VTH. That's the threshold voltage at which a signal is still recognized as a signal. And this is at a max of o plus minus 0.2 volts. Let's have a look at that picture here. So I have here on my scale the differential voltage, okay, not directly referenced to ground. So the zero line here is really our input common voltage between, yeah, the high voltage state and the low voltage state. And the receiver has to be able to decode the differential signal in a voltage range between, yeah, plus minus 10 volt down to plus minus 200 millivolts around the common voltage of both lines. Please note there's also a hysteresis here. So our output signal doesn't change right away or doesn't uh, start to flicker here when we come in that area where uh, we are neither there nor here. Uh, it, these receivers have a kind of a Schmidt trigger built in. I already mentioned that. And we're back in our Renaissance data sheet and there we find the VTH, the receiver differential threshold voltage at plus minus two volts. Perfect. And we also find here the receiver input resistance R in at whoa, 12 kilo ohms. So uh, three times the four kilo ohms that are required. For our input voltages measured to ground, we have to go to the absolute maximum ratings and there's a little disappointment here. So if you have a look here at the input voltages for our AB inputs, uh, yeah, plus 12.5 volts reference to ground, that's quite okay and according to the specification. However, they only aspect <laughs> up to minus 8 volts. So that chip is actually not quite up to spec. I also found nothing in the datasheet about the maximum differential input voltage. But uh, here, for example, you see your input currents defined at different input voltages. Yeah, refer to ground at the pins, which uh, yeah lead to the receiver input resistance. And uh, here is the hysteresis or Schmidt trigger thingy. 
I talked about. And for that chip, it's typical 70 millivolts. So why would you go through all that trouble? Well, five reasons that are all somehow interconnected. First, ensure signal integrity. Second, allow for high data rates. Third, allow for long distances between transmitter and receiver. Third, immunity against noise. And fifth, immunity against electromagnetic interference, EMI. I have here a little graph to illustrate what the RS422 interface is capable of in terms of data rates and distances. Uh, I didn't do the graph myself. It's by EEGRW. Uh, I show it here under the Creative Commons license and I put the link down in the description. So up to 1200 meters cable length. Yeah, proper cable with proper termination, we can have up to 90 kilobits per second with that relatively simple differential interface. And if we go down to 12 meters cable length, we can transmit up to 10 megabits per second. I'm transmitting here now a 10 megahertz square wave over my, uh, well, 25 to 30 centimeter jumper wires here. And you see it's working. Let's have a closer look. The input signal from my cheap Chinese function generator is bad enough, but look what's going on on these long jumper wires. It's atrocious. But still, because we use differential signaling, we still get out a perfect square wave here. Ha! Huh. And <laughs> my chip is only spec'd for a minimum bandwidth of 5 megabits per second. So I'm uh, pushing things here. Now I'm pushing the envelope even further. My transmission line is now uh, a length of 20 meter old Cat3 Ethernet cable. Let's have a look at the oscilloscope. And as you can see, everything is still working perfectly. If anything, the signal quality my receiver gets on its differential pair is improved compared to when I jump it just over with these 25-30 centimeter cables. To recapitulate. I connected my transmitter with my receiver over one, the green, green, white one, twisted pair within the Ethernet twisted cable. And my ground connection, I'm using the blue, blue, white twisted pair, which I connected together at the end. And <laughs> for future reference or use, I used the red, uh, orange, orange, white twisted pair to connect the currently unused transmitter and receiver. Remember, these ISL 8490s are transceivers. They contain a transmitter and a receiver. By the way, twisted pair cable, at least Ethernet twisted pair cable, has usually an impedance of 100 ohms. And again, we have here our 100 ohm termination resistor. Yeah, it all starts to make sense now. And remember, these were 20 meters and we got a better signal quality than with, and I measured it now, 30 centimeter jumper wire. And that just stresses the point of using the right cable for the job. In another project, I totally botched up my one-wire signal or two one-wire signals, it was two one-wire lines, because I was using a totally unsuitable cable for the job. If you want to see my struggles there, uh, there's a one-hour video also where I tried <laughs> to get all <laughs> rid of the data glitches on the lines with uh, all kind of stuff. Uh, never quite managed to, but uh, in the end it worked somehow. Uh, card here, link in the description. 
That's all very well, cable quality and such, but what is now the real advantage of differential signaling? So if your two lines, the inverted and non-inverted line, are always very close together, and of course, when you twist the two wires around each other, you can ensure that there are other ways to do it, and twisted wire in itself has um, yeah, other advantages, but uh, that's not the topic here. And you have some electromagnetic interference going through then the induced voltage, or if they are somehow connected, the induced currents in the lines will have the same magnitude and the same polarity. Because, well, it's when they are very close together, the same field strength they are exposed to. And now I overlay a lower frequency interference, yeah, like a 60, 50 hertz yeah, electromagnetic field inducing some voltages, currents in here. So what happens? Nothing happens. I mean, your common mode voltage, yeah, so the average between your inverted and non-inverted line, that goes up and down the black dotted line. But the differential voltage that is our signal in differential signaling, uh, the differential voltage between my inverted and non-inverted line stays the same. That holds true for uh, interferences that have a much higher frequency than our signal. Yeah, this looks a little bit chaotic, but uh, I hope you can see the principle. So we have our non-inverted and our inverted signal going up and down like crazy with our common mode voltage. But the differential voltage between the two gives us always a valid signal. And by the way, this is of course called common mode interference. Differential signaling, like it is used by RS422, is very, very resilient against that. Of course, there are limitations. We've seen in the specification that the receivers only tolerate uh, common mode voltages in a certain range, but still very resilient. Another thing about RS422, and that has not necessarily something to do with it being a differential signaling technique, is that it is also very resilient against differential mode interference. Yeah, we saw that when I <clears throat> used these cables to transmit 10 megahertz, uh, yeah, my signal form was all over the place. However, you remember the specification, our transmitter has to put out a differential voltage of at least two volts, while the receiver has to be able to detect a signal which is around the common mode within plus minus 200 millivolts. So a band of 0.4 volts. And yeah, uh, in effect, you can waste 80% uh, of your two volts that come out here of your transmitter in some kind of noise and or differential mode interference and your receiver will still get the signal. That's it for today. I think we covered the most important RS422 hardware stuff. And in part two of the basics, we will actually send some data from an Arduino uh, through our RS422 to another Arduino, or we will uh, simply loop back. Uh, I'll see. I don't know yet. Anyway, there will be definitely some the details videos about RS422 where we have uh, to talk about um, do we really need that ground line? Can we use something else instead of an explicit ground line? What about these termination resistors? Are there any other options and stuff? 
But uh, that's in the future. Uh, next week, as I said, a, a little bit of software and actually, you know, sending and receiving data. Till then, bye.